And what this did is it gave us these void spaces in the skyline where we could bring light and air into the towers, and it produced these kind of sky atriums between plates, along with this very bizarre image on the skyline, kind of wall of skyscrapers, or the woven basket of skyscrapers. So these are the United Architects projects, and any time that I'm asked to make a proposal for a vertical building, as well as any of the people in the team, we always bring it to the collective, and we always work collectively. Okay, um, taking some of these systems now to very long urban buildings, um, and I've kind of juxtapo juxtaposed these things in a funny way. I'll show you a, a version of non-modular seriality in a public housing project in the Netherlands, as well as one of the first industrial design projects we're doing, which is a system of cutlery. So the same principles go from tabletop cutlery to 11-story uh, public housing projects. It's, this is an existing building uh, to the south of Amsterdam in a neighborhood called the Belmer. And it's roughly a kilometer long as you walk the distance. And it has 500 apartments in it. There were 31 of these buildings built in a year and a half in the early 1970s. Um, they're being gentrified rapidly. And this building is the one building they're saving where they're keeping 250 of the apartments uh, for rent. And they're gentrifying 250 of the apartments for sale. And so, I tried to mix these up, and we actually designed the whole building in Microsoft Excel uh, in the end. We <laughs> used Microsoft Excel to track all of their apartments, because they have 50,000 apartments. So we wrote a, an interface which would bring Microsoft Excel files into our modeling package and back and forth. And we always presented Microsoft Excel files to them. So this is an Excel document, if you take the bottom element and stick it on the other side, you get this kilometer long building. And the different colors you see are different unit types. There are uh, terrace unit types for small families where every unit gets an outdoor space. There are studio units which have um, workspaces and studios below and above the living space. There are duplexes. There are loft types, there are all these five different unit types that get assembled into neighborhoods of 10 units, which is the police certification in the Netherlands. You can only ever have 10 units on one corridor. And then those neighborhoods of units get assembled along vertical paths of elevators and diagonal paths of escalators. And it's the first time escalators have ever been used in public housing but we make a mixture of elevators and escalators because the escalators are more public because you're outdoors, there's no lobby, there's no vestibule, you're in public spaces, you move on them. And so every apartment has access to one elevator and one escalator. And the escalators let us put more people on a single trunk of space. So in this complex, there are no two neighborhoods that are identical. So you get 50 different groups of neighborhoods of 10 units. And then within those units, the units are all the same. So demographically, you're living with 10, with nine neighbors that are paying the same amount, living in the same kind of space as you. But you're living on these trunks of vertical circulation, which completely mixes you up. And it also gives these things identity. So along this kilometer long length, it has the repetition and modularity of the existing building, but it also has unique qualities along the length. Now, because of the escalators, the structure that holds them, there are 122 <coughs> of these 11-story tall trusses uh, that are all being made off-site, uh, which typically you don't do, but they're made in a factory they're shipped to the site and assembled. And all 122 of these trusses are unique because they're all supporting diagonal escalators. So everyone has a different shape. Now this was the first version of the design. Uh, 
which you may not think it's ugly, but I actually think it's visually unsettling because it's continuous, but there are all these jumps where an escalator starts and stops. You get an abrupt break in the system. So for this, we wrote uh, a custom piece of software which takes over a thousand elements which <coughs> makes up each truss and it lets us place an escalator anywhere in that truss from a Microsoft Excel file. And it will automatically adapt those thousand elements to the position of the escalator in space. It then takes that escalator and moving from right to left changes each truss based on the previous truss and then it cycles back and does it in the other direction. So every time you change even one unit it calculates through and changes 12,000 components for you automatically and actually, you know, in real time. So we can adjust every component of this building and every other component in the whole complex is adapting with it. So a change just at one end changes every single piece of the whole building. What it does is it's like the tempered musical scale of Bach or it's like a, a classical piece of architecture where the part and the whole are discussing things with each other within a serial repetitive system. So this kind of, a, of an aesthetic is an aesthetic that you can only do when the parts are in a complex communication with each other. So, and this is a view of it in a, in a physical model where these elements have all been tempered. Okay, the same principle applies um, uh, I'm doing a series of products with this uh, company, Alessi, and they asked if I wanted to do flatware, like spoons and forks. And they said every architect and designer always designs the spoon, gives them the spoon, and then they base everything off of the spoon. And that just irritated me. <laughs> <laughs> Something could be that modular. So instead, I designed a species of flatware which came from a primitive, and I designed this primitive so that it was an unarticulated thing that had all the information you needed to make a fork, a spoon, or a knife. And as you would unfold this primitive, you could unfold it more towards a spoon, which you see here. Or you can begin to separate those surfaces and produce a knife, or separate them producing spatulas, moving them into forks, and you can also take all of the things in between. So we're designing 22 things that include knives and forks and spoons, as well as cake servers, fish knives, cheese cutters with things to stick the cheese with after you cut it, that are all mutations. So every one of these things is a kind of bastard child of this bizarre primitive. And they're also ornamented and decorated in a very, um, well, they're very ornate. So that all of the things that make the fork, like the tines, get articulated as decoration on all of the other elements. And, you know, we came up with thousands of these things and then culled from those thousands what we were going to produce. And those are going to be made in uh, ceramic, like a translucent aerospace ceramic. You can sharpen and also taste good. It doesn't taste like anything. Um, those came from a coffee and tea set that I did for Alessi, which is the first, as far as I know, mass-produced custom objects made. Um, it, it's expensive to make. The, the nice thing about it is I found a way in Southern California, there's a company that makes all the titanium parts for military bombers and aircraft. And because they only make five or six of these things a year, they've got a very cheap way to make the tools. And they, they make the tools in graphite and then form the skins in titanium. And so I went to them and found a way that we could make a tool for this coffee set for about $600. So for $600, you get a one-of-a-kind coffee set. 